The blood still works. The blood still works. To say it still works indicates perhaps there were some that thought that it didn't or that it stopped working. But they just wanted to remind us that the blood still works. From the day Jesus shed that blood on Calvary, it's been working ever since. And how, how do I know that? Because it saved me. Hallelujah, somebody. It saved me. And if I don't know nothing else in this world, I know that I'm saved. And it's only because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It still works. God bless you, Lily Dale, for those timely selections. Time has come now for the word. For the word of God from the man of God. Certainly no stranger here to Messiah Temple one who loved the Lord, loves the people of God, and loves to preach. And so our lecture this evening will come from the best pastor this side of heaven, pastor of the Lilydale Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor Romel Williams. <laughs> Uh, 
bow with me in prayer. <clears throat> God of grace and God of glory, we do praise and magnify your name. Lord, I thank you for this final opportunity in the year 2015 to stand before your presence, to preach your word to your people. I pray now, Father, that you would not allow me to speak as a mere man, but rather as an oracle of Christ. Use these lips of clay to speak a word of hope to the sinner, to speak a word of healing to the sick, and to speak a word of help to the saints. Oh God, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me anew and anoint me afresh. Hide me behind your cross so that you and you alone might be glorified. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, it's in the powerful and perfect name of Jesus that we pray. Thank God. Amen. Good evening. How many of you all are blessed and thankful to be in the house of prayer today? We praise God for you partnering with us on nights like tonight to exit the year and to end the year in worship. Amen. Let's thank the Lord tonight for Dr. Keith B. McGee, for his hospitality for the Messiah Temple Church. We are so thankful for this fellowship. Amen. Psalm 90. I want to, for the benefit of brevity, lift up a single verse of scripture tonight. I know that we love to celebrate on New Year's Eve. But the Lord has given me a word of challenge for us tonight. Amen. You'll be glad there's another speaker after I'm done. <laughs> Psalm 90, verse number 12, simply says this. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I want to label the message tonight, you're running out of time. You're running out of time. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin said, do not squander time, for it is the stuff that life is made of. Like the sinking sands in an hourglass, our lives are consistently aggressively and inalterably slipping away. Each grain of sand represents an entire day in our brief yet purposed stay on earth. Because this is true for not just one of us, but all of us, I felt compelled tonight to bring this subject that is fitting for this occasion. Even now, we sit here on the precipice, the invisible precipice of a new beginning. The trouble is that we have crossed over so many times before that we take for granted that this will continue to be our plight. The truth is that for any of us, this could be our last opportunity for this new experience. You didn't pick your birth date and you cannot pick your death date. But it is incumbent upon all of us to make the most of the time that God has blessed us with and to maximize what's left because we don't know when it's going to run out. <clears throat> the tragedy of life 
is that we devalue it because we live like tomorrow is guaranteed when it's not. Foolish people waste the time they have been given. Wise people make the most of time because they know it won't last. Now, of all that God has entrusted us to manage, our time is one of the most precious possessions. What makes time valuable is that from the day we were born, it's been running out. Unlike your bank or investment account, none of us knows the balance on our time account. We only know that every day that passes, it's shrinking. Are you asking God to teach you to number your days? Will you be present? Will you be presenting to him a heart of wisdom in how you are spending his time? Tonight, I want to submit this psalm, which is singularly attributed to Moses as proof positive that individually and collectively we are running out of time. This poetic expression seeks to give a poignant sense of the definition of life. Speaking of time, the prayer is an eloquent meditation on God, humanity, and life. It builds a construct that explores the relationship between God and human beings. This song skillfully uses the hand of time to plumb the depths of the human condition and then to point us back to the eternal God. It also invites us to look to God the maker as God the teacher so that we can fully comprehend and participate in what he has provided. Verse 12 is the crescendo, pinnacle, or the zenith of the Psalms, lasting witness to us. The reality of the psalm is an expression made to God or even made against God by the unbeliever. Because for dying people to find true hope for today and true strength for tomorrow, they can only look to a living God. Psalm 90 is a sobering reminder of the frailty and transience of our frailty and transience compared to the everlasting almighty God who created all things, sustains all things, who punishes sin and who extends mercy. Psalm begins with a God has always and will always be. It says from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. While man turns back to dust with no more permanence than the grass which sprouts one day and withers the next, the Lord alone remains. A thousand years with him is like the passing of a single day. But it's not just that compared to God we are like a vapor. When our sins are set before God, his wrath overwhelms us. It's only by his mercy and loving kindness that we are not all wiped out. Hear me tonight. No sin is hidden from him. Our brief lives are an open book written in simple language that God can always read. Therefore, if we are to comprehend life, it must be from God's perspective, not our own. And so I've stopped for just a few minutes tonight to submit to you that 
understanding that life is limited enables us to live deliberately for God. I, I like the way that sounds. I want to play it for you again. Understanding that life is limited allows us to live deliberately for God. The question that I want to ask and answer is simply this. What do we need from God to make the most of this upcoming year? Are you interested? Yeah, there are two requests that help us unpack this one verse. Here's the first one. God, clarify our restrictions. Show us that our lives are brief. The Bible says man that is born of woman is of a few days and they are full of trouble. This is a clear statement about both the brevity and the burden of life. When taken at face value, it is easy to become consumed with the fact that we are weak, hurting, and passing away. The only way we can avoid despair is to take to heart verse 12 and turn to the Lord asking him to teach us to number our days. This has nothing to do with asking him how long we will live or reckoning the average lifespan of a person, but rather asking the Lord to teach us to make the most of every day. Because they are progressing toward a certain end. We need his help to consider every day as a precious gift. A moment in our short number of years in which the Lord has granted us the grace to live. We need to learn not to squander these moments but to invest them with meaning and purpose. Unfortunately, for many of us, our days are filled with meaningless toil, fruitless play, needless slumber, and unhealthy practices. There's nothing wrong with work, entertainment, recreation, or sleep, but do we have a sense of purpose? Have we considered what purpose the Lord might have for us and how we might use the time he has given us to that end? Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays perfectly summarized the brevity and responsibility of time with this poetic expression. I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I will suffer if I lose it. I must give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Life is too precious to waste on trivial pursuits. I am particularly staggered by the overwhelming amounts of youth, young adults, and middle-aged people who are dying these days. There was a time when outside of tragedies and accidents, the majority of the deaths were of infants and seniors. But this changing phenomenon stands as a divine warning that death is closer than you think, and therefore, life is more precious than you realize. Don't waste your life. Don't squander your time. Don't abort your purpose. Don't abuse your influence. Don't fail to appreciate God and all that he has provided to make your life unique. We need to consider the brevity of our time on earth 
Spurgeon says that men are humbled as they look into the grave which will soon be their bed. Their passions cool in the presence of mortality. You see, we need God to remind us that we are pilgrims. We need God to inspire us to maximize each moment. We need God to show us our natural weaknesses as he shares with us his supernatural strength. We need God to give us the grace to live courageously for him against the flow of the world. We need God to teach us how to manage his time for the glory of his name and the good of our journey. God clarify our restrictions. But there's a second request that help us to unearth the truth in this verse. is simply this. God quantify our reverence. Help us to use what's left for you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom in life is tied to our sensitivity to God. Because we approach, we appreciate his love and fear his wrath, we must make sound decisions in life which honor him and keep us aligned with his will. By receiving the Lord's sober instruction on the use of our time, we obtain from him a heart full of wisdom. Consider the universal foolishness of modern society. Most people fill their days chasing after things that won't last. We waste our efforts storing up treasures on earth. Human beings are guilty of seeking pleasures and rewards that will wither and fade like the grass. We are in desperate need of the wisdom of God that turns our hearts to desire the eternal, that which is good, holy, and precious. With the help of the Lord, we can use, we can see beyond the here and now and consider our lives in light of the future hope we have in Christ. This will give us wisdom that will lead us to think responsibly, speak truthfully, and live deliberately. God is holy, and we are not. God is eternal, and we are not. God is faithful, and we are not. Wise people live in appreciation for God's love, mercy, and grace. These attributes counteract our temporal, sinful, unfaithful behaviors in life. Therefore, as an act of gratitude, we must decide to spend the time we have left devoted to God and his kingdom. We have all wasted enough minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years trying to please ourselves and live up to the expectations of other people. We Oh, God, the best of what's left. This truth calls for a radical redefining of our daily plans, pursuits, and practices in order to do what God wills and accomplish his purpose, watch this, for letting us remain. If God asks you, why he should keep you another 365, what would your answer be? This solemn reflection about our days on earth allows us to gain 
a heart full of wisdom. Foolish living focuses only on today and seeks to satisfy immediate desires with instant gratification. An understanding that our days are ordained by God with no guarantee of tomorrow leads us to invest in things that have eternal value. Things that will outlive us. Wise living comes from the wise investment of our time, gifts, and money. One day, we will leave all these things behind. But if we use them wisely, our investments will continue to pay off even when we're gone. See, it's not about leaving an inheritance. It's about leaving a legacy. People with wise hearts cultivate a personal relationship with Jesus. People with wise hearts avoid the very appearance of evil. People with wise hearts are honest with God about their sins. People with wise hearts worship the Lord, serve the church, and expand the kingdom. People with wise hearts study the word, fellowship with the saints, and appreciate spiritual leadership. People with wise hearts pray about each weakness and each strength. People with wise hearts live for God to be experienced through them. I, I want to tell you tonight before I press to my close about John Harper, a preacher from Glasgow, Scotland, who was on the Titanic as she sank in the early morning of April the 15th, 1912. Harper had his only daughter on the ship with him, and he saw to it that she was safely placed on a lifeboat. But because of the neglect of those who had built and launched this ship, there were not a sufficient amount of lifeboats to carry everybody. Harper, we're told, ran through the upper decks saying that the women, the children, and the unsaved should be permitted to get on the lifeboat. And as the ship capsized because of the large tear in her hull made by an iceberg, Harper and 1,500 other people hit the chilly waters of the Atlantic Sea. Harper swam around as long as he could, asking people if they were saved, telling them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved. As his strength began to ebb away, he saw a young man floating on a piece of wood. He looked at him and said, man, are you saved? The man replied, no. Harper proceeded to take off his life vest and to give it to the young man. He said, you need this more than me. The young man tried to argue with Harper, but Harper insisted that he take his life vest and he told him, you, have, you are in need of more time so that you can meet Jesus. Put this vest on and don't worry about me. I'm not going down, I'm going up. And I want to tell you tonight, that John Harper wisely used the final moments of his life to bring glory to his God. The Lord showed him how to number his days so that he could have a heart full of wisdom. You're running out of time. Tomorrow is not promised. This year may be your last. Have you been deliberate with what you've been already given? What changes do you need to make in the time that you have left? 
You see, our lives must be underwritten by the example of Jesus Christ. He was the only person who ever walked the earth keenly aware of the exact day on which he would die. However, he still lived with a sense of urgency and diligence to accomplish everything that God had assigned him to do. Listen to him as he answers his disciples. In John chapter 9, he says, We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no man can work. Oh, that's what I want to tell you tonight. Night is coming when your vision will grow dim. Night is coming when your steps will move slow. Night is coming when your mind won't be as clear. Night is coming when your strength will depart. Night is coming when your support system will disappear. Night is coming when your purpose will have run its course. Night is coming when your life will reach its end. You're running out of time. I'm running out of time. We're running out of time. So remember that only what you do for Christ will last. You may seek earthly power and fame. The world may be impressed by your great name. Soon the glories of this life will all be past. But only what you do for Christ will last. Remember only what you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for Christ will last. Only what you do for him will be counted in the end. Only what you do for Christ will last. Pastor Williams for that challenge. Amen. We're all running out of time. Each and every day we're moving closer and closer to an inevitable end. Amen. Only what we do for Christ God bless you, Pastor Williams. Amen. Amen. It's offering time. It's offering time. Amen. Thank you for the four or five folks that know it's a blessing to give. Amen. Um, as our officers and ushers come, let you know those who uh, may not know that you can text to give if you desire you can text to give uh, the number for that is 773-231-5373 again that's 773-231-5373 or you may also go to messiahtemple.com the giving button there. But for those of you who've got a little too much weight on you right now, we're going to let you come around and drop your offering. Amen. If we can stand, face the center aisles and follow in the direction of our ushers. We come down the center aisle, returning down the side aisle. 